Thank you very much, Ron. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, when I got this invitation, I have to say I was a little surprised because I'm uh, not, uh, I understood the, the nature of the conference, and clearly I'm not a technical person, although the technologies that all of you are involved in uh, are having a great influence on my life. And when I understood the purpose, it was I was really uh, going to speak to you about what I do and how technology might assist, I was really quite intrigued. So I'm, I'm very pleased to share some of that with you this afternoon. Uh, I had an opportunity to attend some of the sessions uh, from this morning, and um, as much as I was able to understand, I found them uh, very enjoyable, very interesting, and clearly there are many parallels with the kinds of investigations or work you're doing in other fields and what I do. But what I want to speak to you about specifically this afternoon is the fact that there is a great convergence, as you are all aware, around cities at this particular time. Uh, it's being propelled by changes in the cost of energy, um, environmental stress, demographic changes, economic changes, and as this is happening, we have moved from a model of the city that was um, widely used for much of the 20th century, which was a, an analytical, um, somewhat mechanical model, to a model which is much more synthetic. In fact, an understanding of cities as problems in organized complexity. And what that means, I think, for information technology is that we now need support for very large-scale, complex, collaborative efforts, multi-party dialogues, and much of this needs to occur, at least in the Western world, in democratic settings, which means that the importance of good information sharing is paramount. Um, the need for comprehensive interacting, interactive mapping, two-dimensional and three-dimensional, that correlates physical, social, economic, and environmental data, uh, that moves into the fourth dimension, uh, that deals with all of those things in a world in motion that enables us to test and get feedback on performance, both social and physical, things like microclimate, wind, solar, uh, operational, things like traffic, circulation, pedestrian environments, and um, finally, the ability to visualize and simulate outcomes uh, to test different hypotheses about what if we did certain things to the city, uh, what would that mean in all ways. So I want to share with you a sampling of the kinds of things that I'm involved in with that in mind. And to, to set it up, um, I want to underline the, the point I started with, that this is a very positive time for city building. Uh, this is a, a scene from the distillery district in Toronto. If you look at that image, you will see an incredible cross-section of people of all ages, of all social categories, for a whole bunch of reasons. In the last few decades, people are voting with their feet. They really want to be in cities. They want to live in cities. They want to uh, make a shift from the um, extraordinary popularity of suburban environments in the 20th century uh, to something which is quite different. Um, this goes along with a, a much better understanding of how cities actually work organically. Uh, this is a scene from Kensington Market in Toronto. This is a, an immigrant reception area in the city. Uh, we would not have understood previously from an economic and social standpoint how important environments like this are where many things are going on uh, in terms of actually growing economies, incubating new ideas, incubating new businesses. So there's a much greater sensitivity to the dynamics of cities looking past the kinds of simplistic visual analyses that we were doing before. We also have in the hearts of cities, and Vancouver is certainly no exception, I'm sure you've seen uh, what's gone on in Yaletown and Coal Harbor and Falls Creek, these incredible reservoirs of obsolescent port industrial uh, warehouse lands in the hearts of cities that are the next great frontier. This is where the intensification is occurring. 
Um, there is a shared understanding that quality of life is an extremely important asset that the cities that are competing successfully globally are doing so not in terms of a race to the bottom in terms of lower wages or lower taxes, but actually on the basis of the quality of life and the public realm that they are able to offer to individuals, to companies, to institutions in terms of making location choices. So what, is, what does all this mean for cities and for the private sector, the, the, my clients in effect, is that the ability to assemble the pieces to deal with complexity becomes the key to success. So this street scene that you see here, what are some of those pieces? Uh, you have the introduction of new forms of public transit, you have an older building being recycled uh, in the center of the image, advertising a new building to come. And the building just behind the gentleman sitting in the, uh, ca at the cafe table is a recycled major warehouse building, part of which is residential, part of which is commercial. The cities that are skillful at choreographing these changes are the ones that will be most successful. Uh, this is a, just an image of a kind of strategic plan that is dealing with a whole bunch of complex issues from some work I did in Washington, D.C. This is just north of the Capitol, uh, where you see those blue lines. That's Union Station, the great railway station in the heart of Washington. Uh, up at the upper right of the image is the wholesale market. Uh, there are a series of neighborhoods who have a great stake in the future here. There was a whole chunk of obsolescent land a new metro station that had just gone in, um, and the ability to understand the relationships between all these seemingly unrelated phenomena and conditions and to portray those interactions in the form of new plans is really what city building is about. So with that general background, let me shift to two serial projects that I've been involved in over the years. One is Boston Cambridge. And underlying this is a larger societal project which goes back to the 19th century, which is the relationship between these urban areas to the great natural features of this area, Boston Harbor and the Charles River Basin. Uh, it goes back to the work of Frederick Law Olmsted on the Emerald Necklace. But in every one of the projects that you see here that I have been involved in, some of which I continue to be, involved in that theme of the relationship between the urban and the natural world has been extremely important, the relationship to these waterfronts. Some of these are public, some of these are private, but I'm gonna start with a private one, which is actually fairly typical of the kind of thing uh, that is going on today as we approach these sites, which I like to say have been revealed by the retreat of the industrial glacier, the obsolescence of many of these lands. This is a site called North Point. It was a tidal estuary. It became a rail yard, a sequence that is uh, actually quite common because it was low-lying land, no longer needed as a marshalling yard. Uh, the railway and uh, my clients who took an equity partnership in this were interested in redeveloping this site, which is right across the Charles River from downtown Boston, as you can see in this image. 50-acre site, 